Jasmine Beach Ferrara with the Campaign for Southern Equality, so a minister of the United States of Christ. And uh, just thrilled to be with you all. I'm very grateful to and thrilled to be with my friends on the panel this morning. Um, if you don't yet know them, I, you'll hear more about them today, and then I hope you'll have a chance to connect with them over the course of the conference day. Let me just briefly uh, introduce to you Bishop Rawls of the Freedom Center for Social Justice. Rabbi Josh Lesser of Congregation Beth Haverim, Alex Patchen McNeil of More Light Presbyterians, and Alba Anofrio of Soul Force. Um, there is a lot to talk about when we think about questions of faith and spirit and religious freedom in the work we're doing for LGBTQ equality and liberation nationally and especially here in the South, where questions of faith are so deeply ingrained in the landscape and history and politics and culture and lives uh, of this region. Um, and what we hope to do today in this, uh, in this plenary session is create a space for us to talk about and take a deep dive in and reflect on some of these things that these faith leaders are seeing and experiencing in this moment in the South some of the ways they're making meaning and sense of that relative to what's happened historically, relative to what we hope is possible in the future, um, holding the reality both of extraordinary progress and also the grief and loss and heartbreak that can be part of this work as well. Um, we're also gonna be talking really specifically about some issues like the wave of so-called religious freedom bills that we're seeing popping up across the South and ways that voices of people of faith can be engaged to help defeat those. And on that note, um, we're not just clergy and faith leaders, we're also organizers, so we've got clipboards. Um, my friend Lee and, uh, is helping to pass them out, and Z. Um, these clipboards will circulate. If you are interested after this panel in receiving an email that will include a list of uh, resources about specific <coughs> ways you can work against so-called religious freedom bills in your state, please sign up here. These are things like template letters to the editor, models of campaigns that we've seen working effectively in Georgia, uh, ways to talk to elected officials and other community members. So please do sign up and we'll follow up with you shortly after the conference about that. Um, the structure today is we're gonna hear from our panelists for a bit and then we're gonna move into conversation and question and answer. So we really look forward to hearing from you all as well. Uh, and we're gonna start, what I've asked the panelists to do is to start today by sharing some stories with us. Stories that are about the work they're doing, what they're seeing, what's really resonating with them right now as they think about these core questions around faith, religious freedom, spirituality in the South, uh, and in our struggle. We're gonna start with Alex. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Jasmine. In thinking about this panel, what came to me was just how long this work can take. I think as organizers, we can get used to um, winning an election or losing an election, and, and it's done and, and immediate. Um, the story that I wanted to tell begins 40 years ago. Mandy Carter spoke yesterday about how we're in a, a moment in time of, of anniversaries, of 50th anniversaries. Well, in the Presbyterian LGBT movement, we just had an anniversary last summer when um, in 1974, at a gathering of, uh, a national gathering of Presbyterians called the General Assembly, <coughs> A young uh, gay clergy person, David Sent, went to the General Assembly and in the middle of a meeting held up a sign that said, is anybody out there gay? Mm. It was really courageous because no one in the Presbyterian world at that time was talking about LGBT issues at all, or at least not in a positive way. From that sign holding, folks gathered and started a group called Presbyterians for Gay Concerns, which later became Presbyterians for Lesbian and Gay Concerns. And in 1978, the Presbyterians uh, had, had put a piece of um, legislation in what's called our Constitution, our Book of Order, that said that openly gay people can be members of our churches but can't be um, uh, put in places of, of power uh, in, as clergy or other kind of leadership. And um, a minister at a church in New York City preached a sermon that Sunday, right after the assembly, that said that there is yet more light to break forth on the scriptures around the issue of homosexuality at the time. 
And suddenly, churches decided that they would declare themselves to be more light, that they weren't going to discriminate against LGBT people in leadership or in membership, and that they wanted to proudly proclaim that. That was 1978. In 2005, I grew up in Asheville. I'm here in my hometown. Um, in 2005, I had discerned a call to go to seminary and become a minister in the Presbyterian Church. Well, the issue with that was that I was coming out at the time as a lesbian, I'm transgender, and when I came out to my sense of calling to the church, I had to answer the question to myself of, was I gonna be out in my process towards ordination, or what was I called to do? And for me, I felt called to both be out in my process towards ordination, and at the time, not many people in Western North Carolina had done that. This is 2005, years after someone held up a sign in our General Assembly. When I, w when I was contemplating this, I had, I had support, thankfully, from my home church, First Presbyterian, just down the road. And, um, but some of my mentors were telling me <coughs> that if I were to do this at, at our, the way you have to do ordination is, is do this kind of in a at our presbytery level, which is a regional gathering, that they didn't know if the laws against ordination in the Presbyterian Church were ever gonna change. They said it might happen in my lifetime. My mentors didn't know if it was gonna happen in theirs. This was in 2005. But we started a conversation when I began the ordination process and was authentic in myself about who I was. And some of the, some of the folks who were with me on that committee, they, didn't, they had never talked about LGBT issues. But they were willing to hear about who I was. They were willing to, to see that I was called to ministry. <clears throat> and um, they were willing to journey with me. And it wasn't until last year, last April, a year ago, when I was officially moved to candidacy in the Presbyterian Church, which is, again, a, a part of a public meeting where I was in a conversation about my faith and my calling, but also very clear that I was transgender and that I had been out this whole time. And by the grace of what I call God, um, they voted yes. Thank you. And uh, you don't have to. That's good. <clears throat> and that was the result of thousands of conversations across the country and in my own presbytery that allowed folks to start considering the possibility and start meeting folks who were openly LGBT and people of faith. And then recently, just a month ago, our denomination voted to be, um, to have full marriage equality within uh, the, our constitution, the Book of Order, as well as allowing ministers to perform same-sex marriages. And I, 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 I say all this because that was, it was a 40-year journey just to get to this one point. And it took hundreds of conversations, people being courageous. Um, and I think that what's needed in this moment around faith and organizing is it's the power of a single person. Again, something Mandy said yesterday. The power of a single conversation that changes hearts and minds and has the ability to help transform folks. It's all in there. Thank you. So I'm Joshua Lesser. The one other piece, thank you. The one other piece that I'd like just to say by way of introduction is I'm also the founder of Sojourn, which is the Southern Jewish Resource Network for Gender and Sexual Diversity, um, of which my colleagues are here with me. And <clears throat> I really wanted to speak this morning about an integrated approach that I hope when it comes to organizing, we can begin to advocate for ourselves as well as begin to educate our equality organizations about the importance of the faith community. Um, we had some of these conversations at this conference last year, and I actually brought it up, but particularly around some of the freedom to marry um, issues that were going on in Georgia what I often found is, is that clergy were great props for press conferences and, you know, we want to see collars and we want to see stoles and maybe a yarmulke, you know, <clears throat> can we get an imam there? And, and th th there really is this way that it can feel like 
a different kind of tokenizing and a different way of filling somebody else's need. And while I have been on the board of our equality organization in deep respect for the work that Georgia Equality has done, it has been incredible. There is, I think, at times an underlying fear about faith conversations. Makes sense. In the Georgia legislature, there are lots of faith conversations happening all the time. And those faith conversations are weapons against our communities. And, and so it often is, let's get, let's excise religion from this conversation and see how we can organize so that we have the best legal strategies and that we have the best political organizing strategy, strategies. And then maybe because of the optic, faith people can be brought to the table. Or if someone like me is willing to do some of these other pieces, I'm asked to keep my faith perspective, an idea around spiritual practices, my understanding about how community can be formed, how <clears throat> incrementalism at times doesn't work from a faith perspective in my understanding. And so there has been a way where I have deeply understood that I'm not interested in keeping that aspect of my wisdom and who I am and my commitment to what I believe could be a larger movement that represented more of us, both from a faith perspective, but also for people who want to advocate um, where there aren't voices, where the legal and the political strategy sometimes can be dehumanizing because they're looking for the legal answer. And I don't think it's an either or. For me, it really is about a both and. So when we had these conversations last year, what I began to recognize is this deeper desire to begin to challenge. And so one of the things that I said to the director, uh, Jeff Graham of Georgia Quality, was there needs to be more of a faith presence. And what he said to me is, is that, well, actually, we don't need LGBT clergy to be having these conversations. We need, actually, for straight clergy to be able to talk to the legislature. Well, it's a good thing that for 15 years, I've been doing interfaith work on issues of wealth inequality, around poverty, around um, in interfaith dialogue, incarceration, so that there were ways where I was able to help make some significant connections. And this began um, by a letter that I end up writing to about 300 clergy, having been the past president of our Faith Alliance. And I just want to add that there are so few LGBT people in those conversations, in the larger interfaith conversations. And like Alex was saying, because I've been doing this work for 15 years, there were straight folks who gotten to know me and my story who I could now call on. And so, the beginning of that organizing around marriage actually became much more important when we started fighting RIFRA, uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And what was incredible is, is that we had a press conference with Baptist ministers speaking against that. And that is something that the Georgia legislature um, had to hear. And it was something that happened because of queer connections. It didn't just... Um, emerge. And so I'm really interested in the conversations about how we take that deeper presence in our ways of making allies that is based on a, a fundamental kind of trust of working on many issues and having a faith perspective into the conversation. Because ultimately, in many ways, the RIFRA battle changed because of faith organizing in Georgia and completely unexpected to me, because I always think that in southern states that it's the Christian presence that's actually going to have a tremendous amount of strength. Something happened within the Jewish community that transformed everything. And in wrapping up, it was all of our denominations being represented in ways that I had not seen in the 16 years that I've been in Atlanta. And the rabbi of one of the Jewish, legislator, Jewish legislators speaking out for the first time, I think politically in any kind of way against RIFRA, his legislator, which he had been in conversation with, 
is the one who introduced the amendment um, that began to slow and stop everything. And so it was profound, and so that there is a way that, and it was unexpected, that's what I wanna say. And that surprise feels really important because as people of faith, there are tools and resiliencies that we bring to the conversation. Even me, Lord, even me, let some drops fall on me. Even me, Lord, even me, let some drops fall on me. I want to open with that because um, as my colleagues have said, <clears throat> oftentimes in settings like this, we are challenged to never lead with our faith, <laughs> to lead with political activism, to lead with whatever the campaign strategy is, to lead with, um, even, even in the moral discussion, um, if we lead with quote unquote morality, um, that is something that is very diffuse and, and in ways that we don't have to kind of own our stuff. Um, I wanted to just share briefly uh, about the fact that I believe, and, and just for full disclosure, I'm also a pastor of, I'm pastor of Sacred Souls Community Church in Charlotte, uh, on our way to the United Church of Christ, actually, um, and very excited about all the prospects of, of uh, this kind of intersectional life I live and work that I do. Um, I, I believe we made a huge misstep as progressives uh, years ago. And um, Rabbi Josh touched on this a little bit. And that was the very intentional decision to jettison faith as it related to our strategies um, as progressives that that was something that at best we would say, okay, we'll have the faith community in, but definitely we're not interested in that playing a significant role. And I, and I'm, I wanna have this conversation, particularly in reference to the South. Um, this is, you know, since we're, this is the Southern Conference, but the impact was actually nationally. This was a, a you know, unspoken but pretty clear strategy. Um, while we were doing that, while we were trying to figure, you know, can I be in community with the Jewish community, and do I, can I say Jesus when I pray? Um, can I, uh, can, can Rabbi come and fully immerse in his tradition? Can Alex be a full Presbyterian Alba? Can she really bring her whole self? And, and the, the truth of the matter is, with all well intention. What we did was, in many instances, diluted our respective core platforms to the point that the power of it was also diminished. And so when we think about that, um, when we were preparing for this panel, um, I was present to the power of the prophetic in organizing work, the power of the prophetic. Um, historically, especially when we think about the South, um, people looked to faith leaders for that kind of prophetic, for that, that, that what do you see out there? What do you see coming? What do you see happening? And in this way that the frame um, does touch all layers, actually, if done well, that, that it is the both and always. If we're thinking about how what we do as organizers, and all four of us are organizers, so we want to uh, bring that frame in. Um, how, do, how does this faith conversation run up and down? What's important to note is while we were running away from faith, um, the conservatives were running to it. And when you think about organizations like Faith, uh, um, um, uh, Focus on the Family, and other groups like that, not only did they run to it, they created a public square that brought the conversations to their square. So even the very name religious right, right? Like when that, that name didn't just show up, 
the religious right isn't just right of center, it is that, but also more importantly, in the public square, it is we are right. And so if you are not in the religious right, and, and, and again, this was another unapologetic strategy, that is the Christian right. Unapologetically, we are the Christian right. That has now become a formidable force. And one of the things I think in terms of timing that is so critical, particularly in North Carolina, and I'm, I'm, I'm based here so it's important, but I want to encourage you all to not minimize what's happening in North Carolina right now. Um, as Jasmine mentioned yesterday, we have a um, very conservative supermajority, which is the first time in our state's history we've actually had this, where our House, our Senate, and our courts, actually, are very conservatively leaning, and our governor. Um, our governor here is probably one of the more vulnerable ones as it relates to this upcoming election year. And it's also an election year, <clears throat> excuse me, where we will have elections for our Senate, for our governorship, and for some other key positions. And if you don't think that, that, that people are looking at that, then we're really sorely mistaken. And so I wanna close with this. I wanna close with the fact that we've gotta get it together and pretty quickly. We really do. Like, we don't have the luxury of time. Um, these things are very real. I'm not trying to do any boogeyman, you know, or boogie woman, or boogie they um, uh, scare tactic. But I am saying that North Carolina is going to impact the state, the, the nation. What happens here? Because of the fact that things are so conservative, this has been a testing ground for many, many things in this region. And so I just want to encourage us to do that. I want to encourage progressives who have grappled with challenges of faith to, to find ways to have authentic relationships with us. I was so glad that, so I'm not even gonna talk about that part because I was gonna bring that in. Um, we can no longer be used as props. Um, we have to be part, critical parts of the conversation. And in some instances, you have to follow us and be okay with that, right? And then I wanna say to faith leaders, um, in fact, actually, um, the Freedom Center for Social Justice is starting what we're calling uh, meetings in the upper room with black clergy throughout the state. Um, we really wanna thank the task force for um, its support of this effort, but it's to have those conversations, um, as Alex mentioned, those kind of one-on-ones and the way we do that work. Um, I have a sign-up thing here. If you are, um, the first phase of this is black clergy, and our second phase is clergy broadly, where we really talk about what some of these changes in the landscape means and reinforce how important our prophetic voices are. Thank you. Yeah, I'm resonating so much with what everyone has shared, and I want to extend that echo to the difference between um, individuals uh, and that like one-on-one -on -one work and the like broader, more targeted but broader overarching uh, leadership that that we're talking about. Um, so I'm going to give one tiny story and then follow up with another one. For example, I work with Soulforce, and we're a national organization, but we've been to 101 schools, and a lot of those are in the South, and I'm from Asheville and across North Carolina, as is 50% uh, of our very small staff, so we're very rooted here. Um, and so Cigna had started offering trans health care on campuses. We mostly historically have worked on Christian uh, campuses, and started offering trans health care to students. The leadership, the board of directors and president of some of these universities, um, one in particular I'm thinking about, Biola, was like adamant that this was not okay. And so just as quietly, Cigna removed that from the student handbook and who was available to get this kind of health care, right? So I want to talk a little bit, okay, thank you. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about with the Occupy movement when we talked about the 99% and the 1%. When I talk about religious freedom, and I think when a lot of us do, we're not talking about necessarily your average Joe or Jane um, who is going to church every Sunday trying to live out their faith values. We're talking about a very organized, very resourced 1% at the top that are specifically organizing and strategizing politically 
for wrapped up in capitalism and lots of exporting of our uh, fundamentalist Christian culture to other parts of the world for financial gain. So this is a, it's a different, I think it's really important to shift those out when we talk about who our opponents are. Um, because it is very structured, it is very organized, family policy councils are real and they create legislation that gets copied across states. So I think it's really important to separate that when we talk about who, who is our adversaries and who are our um, allies, and particularly when we're talking about changing hearts and minds. So my story is about um, a group of youth who were working um, particularly on Biola campus and having this kind of frame of like the, the school being so able to control one's grades, registration, uh, expulsion, and um, even like documents that say what, like your transcript to be able to transfer in or out. There was a conference, a racial reconciliation conference called SCORE, which is a very big conference that they have every year. And uh, a group of our students spent just weeks getting trained on all of the different workshops that were going to be there and how to engage in conversations because our focus is on intersectional organizing. It isn't just about LGBTQ people. Um, most of our crew identified that way, but it was also about we understand that we, that we use these issues as divisive issues. And so going to this conference for the first time, we had these young people, 19, 20, 21 years old, stepping up and speaking back to professors with doctor in front of their name um, and professors and executive directors of organizations and saying like, hey, we're having a conversation about reconciliation and we focused on white people's discomfort in all people of color spaces. We've talked about this language around why we should be able to like forget race or be colorblind and see past it to get in reconciliation. So in those spaces, we're talking about racial reconciliation, but nothing about LGBTQ people. And there's an intentional divide in those, keeping those issues separate. So for me, it's really exciting when we talk about how young folks, all folks really, but our target is specifically young people from particularly fundamentalist context, for the first time begin to find their voice and begin to say, I, their report back. I will never allow that space to be unoccupied by someone who is able to say, hey, we're not talking about this. This is really important to who we are if we're going to talk about rac racial reconciliation or if we're going to talk about uh, reparative therapy. So I feel like it's really exciting to talk about doing that work at the base and talking about doing that individual work. And we can never, ever uh, underestimate the importance and power of individual people finding their voice for the first time in really hostile context. So when I think about what we're doing, one of the pieces feels like healing from spiritual violence is a real thing. And it's a real thing that happens through being empowered with our voices, with knowledge, and with community that say, it's okay for me to speak my truth, and I now have a name like transphobia or like racism that connect to this experience, this thing I've been tasting in the water, and now I can name it, and now I can claim it, and now I can start to heal from that process in community. So for me, when I'm thinking about individual uh, rights, I feel like that's a con that the entire structure of individual rights is wrapped up in this idea of white supremacy that says I have autonomy or hierarchy over my beliefs, over my body, I have sovereignty over where I am in the world that has something that has only been afforded ever to white people and particularly like white male body people. Um, that is something that we have to get past. We have to get past this, like, I have the right to discriminate against whoever I want to because my God says that it's okay. Um, we have to get to a place where we say, no, we are actually interconnected and interdependent, and therefore we have to understand how we move and flow through the world so that all of us actually get our needs met, and then from there we can start talking about what is next. But I kind of um, feel like until we get to that place where people can live free from fear, where that college student isn't so deeply mired in the like milieu that is around them to see that I'm not the only one, that we are together, that there are other options for my life and for my theology and for my God and for my spiritual practice that are affirming of my whole self, of my being, of my sacred value. Um, as a human being, then we don't get to go past that to these other conversations. So. I'm mostly just thinking about how those things work together and how we use spirit as a way to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you all for setting this table. My uh, mind is kind of popping with all the threads, the themes of prophetic voice, integrated models of organizing, talking about the arc of history, the power of the individual voice, how we heal from spiritual wounds. Let's take some time for you all to kind of engage and respond to what you've heard, share what's on your mind, and then we're going to open it up to questions and comments. Um, I, I think it's really uh, interesting, as Alba brought up, the conversation around the hard conversations within progressive movement. Um, and there are some things that get in our way of having greater success. Um, some of it is around race, and those are very real conversations that uh, we struggle with quite often, actually. Um, and that spills over even into how we engage with other populations. So, you know, there's this narrative that the black church is the most homophobic, and in some instances even have been um, uh, credited with uh, undermining certain kind of progressive positions. Um, in reality, actually, uh, there is nothing statistically that supports that narrative. In reality, in most instances, um, the communities of color that we're talking about as kind of, you know, we have to watch out for um, are much more, much further down the line than many of us know. And because we don't, we're not willing along racial lines, along class lines, to engage in a way that isn't so fear-driven um, or presumptive, we're less effective. And so I want to suggest that some of those narratives around race are, um, are hindering our work and also around class. Mm -hmm. In some instances, I think class actually is a bigger conversation than race. And we have to be okay talking about that. And um, I, I, was, I had a, a lunch with some friends yesterday and, and I was, you know, you get real clear about like kind of what's your, especially when you, you know, you're getting a little longer in the tooth, you know, so I'm, a, I'm of an age that you really start thinking about, okay, now what can I do, <laughs> right? So I'm trusting there's someone that has a lot of passion and energy around that <laughs> who will uh, want a deep dive and just call me when, you, when it's going. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I wanted to just note that. I was, I was glad you brought up race and class and um, difference in those ways. And I really appreciated that you, when you talked about, you know, feeling this tension about going against the campaign strategy. Yes. Yeah. And when you talked about that, I realized even having been the chair of a campaign against our Georgia marriage amendment, mm -hmm. that the faith conversation isn't a part of the campaign strategy. Yeah. Like it doesn't even start there. There's, there's not a, an aspect of it. And <clears throat> Um, when I was a plenary speaker at the NGLTF conference a number of years ago where we were talking about faith, um, some of the feedback was that it was an incredibly painful experience because um, out of the clergy that spoke, I was the only person that talked about secular people. And the secular folks and folks who identify as agnostic or atheists um, feel oppressed when we, when we are present. And so I've, I feel very sensitive as a religious minority in the South of wanting to be able to expand who can um, be in that. And that I believe that our faith strategies can be about the holistic well-being in a lot of ways, Alba, that you spoke about that don't necessarily have to be God-infused, though it may, it may be for us. And for me, the other piece along those lines, in terms of what are the obstacles to get to being a part of the campaign strategy, I think is for us also to look at um, what are the ways that the prophetic voice sometimes is misused everywhere. Um, what is the conversation for humility? Where are their spiritual practices? How can we support folks um, in a deeper consciousness of themselves, which is what I think that our faith tradition, because when we start talking about privilege and, and parts of us start shutting down or we feel internally conflicted, I know that my spiritual practices are what keep me open. Yeah. And so there is a way that I want to support people being open to hearing the difficult pieces about what does it mean to be male-bodied, what does it mean um, to have white privilege in this world, and, and not shut down and not walk away 
but be present um, so that what does bind us on a universal level can be present as well as the way that we live our lives radically differently can be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. That's good. There's so much richness. Um, <laughs> I think that something that you said, Alba, really spoke to me around this idea of separating out the 99% versus the 1% of folks who are uh, strategically deployed and resourced and organized to, to uh, implement a strategy around a more right-wing leaning faith. Um, I think that's just so, I think that's so powerful as an image to think about how we're at a moment where the 99% of us who identify as either people of faith, people with values, and I wanna think about this pluralistically rather than, I think we talk about interfaith dialogue, um, but what if we talked about pluralism as a way to acknowledge and honor those who uh, don't have a, a, a particular faith or agnostic um, uh, and wanna claim that. Um, but I think this is an opportunity for those of us who are in the 99% to occupy our faith and our beliefs. And I believe that this conversation around um, religious liberty and religious refusals is a really key moment to, to have faith lead. And I saw this in Texas. I was in Texas last week uh, because uh, I've been working with some, with some groups um, around helping people of faith to stand up and talk about why uh, discrimination in the name of faith is not their faith values. And I, I heard a story from a woman who's a Presbyterian um, member of a church, not a pastor, but she and her wife went to their congressional representative's office, who happened to be the one who introduced that really terrible transgender bathroom bill in Texas, maybe you've heard of it, and they just marched right in there, and they talked to their legislative aide, and they were sharing that they were Presbyterian and people of faith and, you know, talking about why this is not, this is not something that they value in their faith. And, the, and, the, and, the, and Congressman Bell heard them, and he came out of his office, and they sat down and had a 30-minute conversation about, about their faith, which I think was a really pivotal moment. I mean, who knows what he'll think about it, um, kind of going from that. But I think it was this really clear moment where having a conversation where we led with our faith values Perk the ear of a congressional person. I mean, how often can we say that happened? Um, and so I think that there's something to this religious liberty stuff that it's clearly framed in the language of faith, whereas um, we talked a lot about in the marriage uh, efforts around you know, rights and then values, and then there was a place for faith to come in. But I think that it's centered in faith, and I think it's centered in values that we have an opportunity to build this 99% of us who don't believe that this is a good strategy for any of our states. Um, and so I really want us to figure out how we can claim that. And um, I think there's going to be a caucus opportunity mm -hmm. um, for folks to come together later today over lunch to talk about how might we in our individual states think about um, living into uh, standing up as people of uh, faith and moral courage, as Auburn said, Auburn Medium says. Yeah, I was really resonating with this uh, with this uh, such truth telling around um, diluting what we believe uh, publicly in order to be more palatable to more people. And so I think it really I think it's important to reclaim that kind of identity and also reclaim the moral authority that it gives to us. And so I, I appreciate how and know that there are places for all of us in this work, right? And so all of us aren't called necessarily to be the compromisers who all come to the table and all like mm -hmm. make sure everybody feels happy and affirmed in their own particular identity. I think that there's actually places for lots of us I identify more hardline of like, let's name the stuff that we're like, that's, had it, that's sitting on the table, um, which is, does leave some people, like you said, like particularly folks with different kinds of privilege feeling like, oh, there's not a place for me. And that is a really, I think that's a real conversation that we need to have about 
what do we do so that folks who feel like they have been excluded or traumatized um, by church spaces or political spaces or society at large because of their embodiment, how do we find safer spaces for those people to actually like worship and be whole and be safer? And how do we, from those positions of power, come to the table as getting closer to um, an equitable and equal kind of discussion of what's going on? So Bishop Rawls, when you were saying like, the, the idea that we have stepped back from the microphone in terms of like our faith, I think that that's really what I at least see when I see the, the far right step into that role with, with a lack of a counterpart on the other side, I feel like people of faith often feel like they have no choice. Mm -hmm. They can either choose to live into this moral belief, which is very scripted, or they can have a like live and let live kind of thing, but not express it publicly. And I'm really hungry for that kind of hardline position on the other side that says, we are people of faith. This is what we believe in my denomination or in my individual um, understanding of the divine. And I actually am like standard flat footed mm -hmm. and strong here. And I'm not moving from this position. And then we can speak about where do we compromise from there. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciated what you were saying about reclaiming that too, Alex. Wonderful. Well, lots of rich fodder here, and we're excited now to turn it, open it up, rather, to folks in the audience. Um, unfortunately, we don't have mic stands set up, so if you have a question or comment, if you, we can try to get a mic to you, or if you feel like you can project, um, we'll, we'll try that way as well. Anyone ready to jump in? Sure. Hi. I think y'all can hear me. Yeah, I can. Good. Um, I'm Paul McNeil. I'm the father of Alice. Um, I think one of the things she, I think this is a very pivotal time. I think you need to understand the church, uh, in particular, goes through a rummage sale every 500 years. And guess what we're in? We're in the rummage sale right now. We're in that 10 to 20 year period where we make a choice of what we're going to keep and what we're going to throw away. So if you don't get engaged in the dad does conversation, then you're going to lose. You're going to lose this time because it's going to be another 500 years before we make this choice again. So I encourage you, being in your churches, I know you feel like immigrants in your church. I got that. Because of how they treated you. I got that. But your choice right now is to be a part of that conversation. To make that rummage sale, because what happens every 500 years is the church comes out stronger on the other side. It's very chaotic right now. People are trying to figure out what's going on. But you've got to be a part of that conversation. You've got to step up and make that happen. If you don't, no one else is. So thank you, panel, for your time. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. I just I want to say something because maybe Alex can't, um, which is that um, I'm I'm assuming that you do do this, but we really do need allies like yourself to help make those conversations available and create the the space for that because it isn't always the most easy or more most natural way, and that some of us. Um, may have varying degrees of obstacles to overcome, and some of us have had the privilege of being supported with different kinds of courage along the way. But when allies really find the role of being able to make those connections and then allow that voice to actually be heard and step back is very powerful. So I appreciate the way that, that you do do that, and that still needs to happen so that people can be at the rummage sale. And for me, Rabbi Josh, that, that speaks to something I do want to make sure we take some time for, which is just really weighing on my heart, and I know other folks, um, is, is the urgency of why this matters, especially to our youth who, you know, Alba, are in the thick right now of being wounded spiritually um, and may not have the agency um, to, uh, to seek out or, or even be within hours of a space where they're going to receive even the most basic level of affirmation. And so in the work that 
we do with CSE and that I watch you all do with such admiration, I think w one thing it is about is trying to get affirming voices and content into the public space so that we may not be able to be at the kitchen table with that kid, but we may, there may be a way that they see a headline or hear a voice on the news or find some content online that opens up, a, a, puts a little bit of a light on. So I just wonder if you all, in the, if we can talk a bit more pastorally now um, about, um, about this dimension of our work. How do we think about folks who are recovering from spiritual wounds but also being wounded right now? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm based in Charlotte and um, in North Carolina, I think we've had five youth suicides um, in a very short period of time, mm -hmm. um, several uh, in Charlotte itself. And um, I don't know if you all know that um, we have recently, I guess last month, we had a uh, fight in our city council around religious refusals. And um, I have to say, and I've done a lot of organizing work, like 20 years or so, 20 plus years, um, I have never experienced anything like what I experienced in that city council chamber. Um, it was 115 or 20 testimonies um, of some of the most horrific uh, rationales I have ever heard. It's kind of interesting because you realize how much of a bubble we can live in sometime when you don't kind of hear un, uncut <laughs> uh, what people are really thinking. And to see person after person stand up and to see little children holding signs saying, I want to feel safe when I go to the bathroom, you know, stuff like that. Um, because I don't want trans people in the bathroom with me. It really became about bathrooms, uh, to be quite honest. And um, uh, what it left me with, outside of literally being sick for two days, I did testify, but um, uh, the pain that was present, and it was aired, so the pain literally that rippled through the region was, was, was palatable. Mm -hmm. And um, so it left me realizing a couple of things. One is I'm concerned I'm concerned about how prepared or not we are for some of these fights. And I believe it's a real concern, it's valid, and, and that we're gonna, it's gonna take us working together to figure not only how we ready ourselves, but how we ready our people. We have the gift of a heads up. So marriage, and we thank God so much for uh, some of the work of CSE and others, who helped to give us this magnificent win around marriage equality. Um, and I think it surprised people because marriage was likely gonna be the strategy leading into 2016. Now that that's off the table, these RIFRAs are going to be the thing. We can, you can know that it's gonna be the thing. This is where the battleground is gonna be. So I'm very interested, which is why we're doing the meetings in the upper room, which is why we have an equity uh, strategy that the Freedom Center is working on with other allies. Um, if you want to know more about some of the successes we've had with the Moral Freedom Summer, that's another, another piece. But, but we really have to, as people of faith and allies to people of faith, um, um, not be so afraid is what I want to say. Mm -hmm. Um, I think somewhere along the line we got scared. Um, we got, and, and I'm not even saying it's all unjustified when you live in the South, um, and it's hard for others who don't live in the South to understand fully what I'm saying, but there are prices we all pay for doing the work we do. And it is not easy, and it doesn't get rewarded well, often. Um, and in, in many instances, it, it, it sacrifices that not only we, but our families pay. And the, the lift is so much heavier because we have so many people who have been so traumatized in this region, so many people who have um, multiple, uh, uh, multiple areas of marginalization. So I can't just do a strategy. I've also got to think about the fact that the person coming to the campaign didn't get to eat or mm -hmm. that because poverty is such a prevalent piece for us or they don't have health care and so 
they had to take their kid to the emergency room because we don't have a doctor. And so it's just a bunch of thoughts in my head, but I, I just, I just want to say we have to get ready. We know where they're coming. They're going to talk about religious refusals. And so what is our response in terms of how we're going to show up in the public square and how do we take care of our people on the back end of what I think may be some of our ugliest fights to date? That's what I was wanted to just touch on for a second, is like how do we heal our people? And when I hear more than I have ever heard, and I've been in this organizing work only about 10 years, 12 years, something like that, but when I hear a whole group of young folk talking about there's no reason to live, having multiple friends at a time on suicide watch, having people I know in like PhD programs, in, like. There is something that is tangible and palpable right now that is rippling through. And for me, that, and because of my faith, I say, like, there is a spiritual need that, it, that is happening. That is, a, that is a sign of a spiritual need. And so how do we, as leaders of faith and as people who are allies to people who don't have a particular religious denomination or affiliation uh, or a home church in that way, how do we send out messages through the world that resonate with our people and particularly with our young people that say, like, there is hope, we can win, we do strategize together, we have survived, we have been around forever, we will continue to be around forever. How do we build that sense of like, in the midst of all of the suffering, we are still here and we will persist and we will win because we believe in the sacred worth of our people and we know that we will keep each other alive. Uh, can I just add what, yeah. what, one thing quickly? <clears throat> Whether, whether it's this conference or NGLTF or a number of conferences, I've been wondering, um, are there particular roles that clergy could play as spiritual directors throughout the conference where people could sign up? Yeah, for me, there's just something very incredible of being able to witness and listen to people's story and just be with someone for a moment. Um, in my tradition, this idea of, of patience, of forbearance is about holding someone else's burden with them for a while. Mm -hmm. And if there's a way that we can do that, that mm -hmm. ability to touch that courage that I think um, is pretty, that resides within most, if not all of us, is easier to tap mm -hmm. and easier to begin to build that kind of trust. Mm -hmm. And so I, don't, I think that there are a whole lot of pastoral kinds of ways of what can we add to how, what happens when we organize mm -hmm. that could transform what we do. Well, I'm excited to share that we have a chaplain at our conference, which I neglected somehow to share yesterday morning. And I think, and I'll introduce as Reverend Lisa Bove Kemper, who is an incredible faith leader here in Asheville, um, and um, has uh, graciously offered to be available as a uh, in, a in a chaplaincy presence. If folks haven't experienced chaplaincy before, it's just kind of what we've been talking about: someone who is there to listen, to offer support. Um, if it turns out that there's a high demand for chaplaincy support, maybe some of our other faith leaders here would be willing to join that team, and that's certainly something we can uh, move forward with. I, I, we've got to close now simply because of time, but this conversation is far from over. Um, and I just have to say I'm so inspired about this concept of what a framework for organizing that synthesizes the political, the legal, the theological, and the pastoral. Yes. Um, as those two critical dimensions of faith work could look like as we head into a landscape in which we're in the throes of and also facing more work around um, beating so-called religious freedom bills and the, know the daily urgency with which folks are working to heal and survive and hopefully thrive. Um, I thank all of you for being with us this morning. I thank all of you for the work you do each and every day.